Hello everyone, just one final thing, might as well transfer over so you can see me, you see me in my uh, cowboy hat, not a blue cowboy hat though, uh, but one final thing is I'm going to uh, share it in one final spot, come on, there we go, yes, I've been streamed for three minutes, just sharing the link around, that's all, and in two places. Places and then, um, it's a weird day for me because I literally just woke up. I almost like back in high school, we're just like I, uh, I literally just like roll out of bed as it were, and then I'm like now awakened here. Um, yeah, as because the situation with, with me is like, like, yeah, this week is uh, a day off for me. The week is a week off for me because yes, yeah, this uh, this Thursday is a special holiday. Uh, yeah. Mm. That's a lot of notifications. I'll figure that out later. Uh, um, I'll maybe read it uh, during the break. You know, uh, one more share. Or, uh, oh, maybe I can share it to Reddit. Uh, I have to figure out, find a place, a community to like share this in place to Reddit. But the thing is, like for me, is like in some of the places I share this with. No, I'm actually active in that community. Actually, I, I talk a lot, share a lot, uh, I communicate a lot, uh, uh, post there or interact with the people in those uh, communities. But there are a bunch of communities that I just like join and I just see, oh, a clear promote yourself here, and I just like bam, pop the links there, and I've been like doing that regularly a lot. Okay. And, but, uh, I'll look at that later, uh, because, like, now I'm doing this. Uh, hello, everyone. And, uh, hello, I'm chatting again. Oh, I'm gonna turn on my tablet, because I like to use this as a way to, like, monitor the uh, stream. Even though this is, I'm, I'm just reading. Yeah, so it's just, like, it, it should absolutely be fine, because as there's nothing that's going to tax my system other than, like, OBS. And so, it's all fine. But still, I like to make sure that, like, I'm streaming. You know, in case, like, my internet goes out, which that does happen. Uh, so, welcome, everyone. And, again, this is another uh, charity stream. Uh... All my streams are going to be charity streams until, like, uh, proven otherwise. Thank you for the follows uh, from my new followers, uh, Simon3581. Uh, I, I, I think I know who, who, who they are. He is, actually, because we chatted before. And, that, and thank you for the follow, uh, Chaco. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so now... I always appreciate new followers because maybe that will like get me like I I I'm not even gonna think about getting a partner. I don't care about it's like earning extra money so that I can like give it to my friends like my friends Joanna who's the current uh, recipient of this charity stream right now. Oh, there is her story right there. Um, and in the months is always difficult for Joanna. She lives on SSDI and only gets thirteen hundred dollars a month. And it's, it, it, this actually happened to me too. Uh, a bunch of charges like it hit her account at once, and the bunch of charges hit my one of my credit cards caused it to max over just a little bit. But I took some money from my new checking or my savings in order to like pay it off and get it down below the like uh, limit. But I'm also going to get paid this Friday regardless. I mean, those a day off, and I saw that should take care of that. And and my hat just hit my microphone. Apologize for that. Um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, she had a bunch of charges like it hit her account all at once. I still need medication. It's currently got paid off, but like, gee, you can still use any money that you can easily give uh, at any point to like help her out. And and so, oh, in the in the YouTube um, uh, up real upload to this one, eventually get around to it. Uh, you can also uh, join us links. I'll have to remember to put it in the description uh, below, but also her links um, in the uh, charity link page. It's also there, and what I'm talking about is no, it's not www. Done is that's a charity links page that's a it basically is a, a url to a google doc that i manage and that google doc that is a filled with a whole bunch of like links to various different people who needs like helps like people's gofundmes people's paypal pools including many of my friends 
so many people with GoFundMe, so many people with PayPal pool, so many people were crowdfunding, and yet <laughs> the crowd doesn't have a lot of money. The rich keep on getting richer, and the poor are just like spreading around the same hundred dollar bill through like everyone. And it's like we don't, the list of like poor people that need help is growing longer and longer. And yeah, someone said that I was like the monetary equivalent. Oh man, no, I, I forget it. it. The main character in like Will Mears Rapa, I need to read that book or watch the musical. Um, because um, the, the, the character at the beginning that, like, going to jail for stealing bread. Uh, I'm that character, essentially. I'm their equivalent of it. Which is probably why I became an anarchist and a narco syndicalist and a communist. But anyway, um, I got my hot water leaf juice here. It's just normal black tea. Um, it's almost done. In the next break, I will make some more. Kind of, like, Waste of time to like uh, start late right now, but I'm here now. And uh, if uh, people come in and like uh, check this out, that's great. If not, I'm recording this and we're gonna like put it up on like YouTube, so at least people can still watch it on YouTube. So now we're going to uh, chapter six of Direct Action and Economy by David Graeber. There's the link to the actual um book itself where I got it from as well, and uh, so you can read along with me as you I do. And so, uh, we're in chapter six. So we covered the first four chapters, where is a diary of, uh, David Graeber's, like, activities and, and actions that he participated in leading up to the summit of the FTAA, Free Trade Association of Americas. I don't know. Uh, but it's, essentially it's kind of like a globalization, like a free trade kind of like an um, organization and similar to like the World Trade Organization. So they, so the summit was in Quebec City in April of 2001, um, 20th, 21st, 22nd, I believe. It, it was in the chapters before, so, uh, but, like, and a lot of activists wanted to, like, um, make that summit be similar to, like, Seattle with the WTO in 1999, where they kind of successfully shut down uh, the WTO uh, presentation, or at least the public facing aspects of it, the pomp and circumstance of it. it I, I think David Graeber mentioned in his previous book, May He Rest in Power, David Graeber, uh, that the WTO uh, trade deals went on just in secret, as it were. Uh, and, and this, we're, they were trying to do more trade deals like that for the FTA, but, and then the New York uh, Direct Action Network, Dan, and New York uh, uh, chapter of the Zabistas, along with other, like, affinity groups, a lot of organizations, wanted to, like, they, they stop that. So that was the first four chapters of the book, a diary of those events that David Graeber was a part of, and from his telling, as well as, like, first-hand accounts. And now, in the chapter five, was more just the theory part of it. Talk about direct action, anarchism, um, violence versus nonviolence, and also a brief history of, like, a, a leftism, activism, and or, or direct action, and kind of like a... a culture or activist culture since the 60s a very brief history but now this is going to be interesting we have chapter six of direct action and iconography and some notes and chapter six some notes on activist culture so this is going to be quite interesting actually uh because at least with David Graeber, you cannot say that like he was just sitting on the silence, not doing anything, just observing from the outside and making some comments on it. No, he's been did a lot of activism as some of the when it was in, when he was in America. Maybe he did still did as an activism, and when he got moved to the UK because he got kicked out of Yale, he literally just got kicked out of Yale uh, because of his political ideology. He got involved with a student that like um, was protesting something at Yale, and Dave Graeber side with the students. And Yale just cut his, like, um, it just did not renew his contract at the B associate professor. And, and he, and Dave Graeber also said that, like, no, there were professors that did not like me because I'm an anarchist. You, if you want to, for me, you, if you want to be authority above me, that authority, that hierarchy has to be justified. And in Dave Graeber's opinion, it wasn't. It's just because that professor's been there longer or something, or tenure or something like that. And, and Dave Graeber wasn't rude to the person, but it, it, he still did not agree with this whole notion. It's like, no, you have to be uh, a, Serbi uh, um, a subservient to me. And it's just like, or something. And Dave Graeber was like, no, you got to earn that. No, it's got to be justified. But anyway... 
And so yeah, so I I trust that like David Graeber actually has some like some notes on active sculpture. So I'll read onwards. Twelve minutes in, I finally come to start reading. <laughs> Uh, this is why my streams go on for like four hours just on one chapter because I just yep, 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 yep. Yeah, which is why I started Twitch streaming because I know I can't fucking shut up. <laughs> just drop the F-bomb there. That's why this is a mature rate stream. But miners are welcome to come. I, I'm not going to ex exclude my streams to being like, no, this is an 18 plus stream or something like that. No, I, I will welcome uh, miners into my streams. Just know that, like, I curse and talk about, like, uh, other things. I, I don't try not to get too flirty, though. No, not really. I, I don't think that would be appropriate for me, it, unless the other people want to. But it's like, no, I don't want that kind of happen on my these streams. I want people to have fun. I want people to have like also feel safe and have fun. But I do curse, so that's why this this stream is for mature audiences. Anyway, I'll start. I started this book with the first CLAC tour that has passed through New York in early 2000. Let me flash forward about a year and talk about the second CLAC tour to do so. One held prior to their uh, Take the Capital Action in Ottawa during the 2002 G8 uh, meeting in Kanashkinsky. Uh, Kananaski. The audience for such tours intended to consist mostly of white anarchists, but this time the CLAC people uh, made a whole uh, point of bringing in at least one speaker from a local community based in a group in each city they passed through. In New York, this turned out to be a organizer named Ranajistith. Ren from um, a radical South Asian uh, group called Yensen Rising Up and Moving Drum. Nice. Uh, nice. That's, I mean, you can't get an acronym there, right? Nice. Um, at the time, Drum has earned enormous support in New York activist circles for its work on immigration detention issues, which uh, we're still like, dealing with now, of course. It's a constant struggle. I guess freedom is a constant struggle. Uh, which is a de which was a decent book by Andrew Y. Davis. Um, of special interest there is the in the immediate wake of eleven September eleventh, uh, when hundreds of people of Middle East and Southeastern Asian descent <clears throat> have been swept up and effectively disappeared. Mm. The speakers from Canada describe campaigns they've been involved with and talk about organization dilemmas of one sort or another. Renjenif uh, talks, uh, was, talks was different. It consists mainly of condemnation of active culture. Himself, he himself, he kept emphasizing, was not only of Indian descent, but a working class kid from Queens. He knew something about the communities with which he was working. Since Seattle, all anarchists have been talking about has been and how to move away from summit hopping to working more closely with communities in struggle. The problem he emphasized, was that they had developed their own style of dress, manners, and way of talking, taste in music, and food. A kind of hybrid mishmash of hippie, punk, and mainstream middle-class white culture. When... No, I kind of like like how uh, Deeper does start by like echoing the voices, uh, the voice of like uh, someone from a marginalized uh, position, and to criticize, um, which I think is still a prevalent problem, actually, honestly, of this middle class white culture that are the like middle class white anarchists, as it were. I can honestly point to like certain like um, online personalities, uh, online leftist personalities, or, or people that claim themselves to be leftists that are trying to like even promote the cause, but are from a, a white working class, a white middle class, as were. Well. Actually, I could fall in that category. I have to like really check myself a lot as well. I'm working class though, uh, but because I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I'm maxing out my credit cards to help uh, assist my friends as much as I can financially. But I'm from a, privileged, a very, very privileged background, so I have to remember that and check myself uh, as I'm trying to like help uh, other communities and help uh, marginalized communities. I, I should know my place. So I'll continue. Uh, with incorporated chunks of m more... Exotic revolutionary traditions, and this made it Im almost impossible for them to communicate with anyone outside their own little charm circle. Yeah, that's so. Yes, kind of like the clicks in high school can still continue to happen afterwards. Uh, some elements of this activist culture the rejection of personal hygiene standards. 
Oh, just... Just don't try to make it cool, though, that you're not showering or not. If, if you have find that difficult to do or you have, like... Or it's personally difficult to do. Okay, then yes, no, there you go. People with disabilities have a difficulty to, to uh, shower themselves, but still, don't make it the the cool thing to do. Just reject it. Ugh. Uh, for instance, were considered downright offensive by most of those with whom they wish to form alliances. Others, like the vegan diet, made it impossible to sit down at the table with almost anyone who was not already an activist. Ah, uh, yeah. There are some cool vegans out there. I know uh, my friend uh, Phoenix, uh, whose panel's in the um, about page, and um, it has a YouTube channel where she's criticized a lot of vegans, active a lot of vegans on YouTube and in, online and other places. And yeah, the vegan community, there's like a lot of problems with gaslighting, and most and of the, the vegans I know of that are cool are at least uh, like anarchists, libertarian socialists, or anti-capitalists, and so and that's where the veganism come from, or that's where their focus is of their vegan activism is to like get rid of capitalism as opposed to anything else, because the meat industry is another industry, and um, but yeah, they, even my friend Lita Ano, the co-host is just just outraged. She has her opinions about vegans as well, and with like the few exceptions of like. Uh, Phoenix, uh, uh, our friend Jamie J, like the Flight One, and uh, Captain Andy are being the cool vegans that are at least not as annoying as other vegans, kind of like with this one as well. Uh, activist culture was uh, choking the promise of the movement, and anarchists had uh, made up their minds of what they already want to do. Uh, I'm going to come back. Actually, I'll let me come back to this point. It's like it makes it makes it impossible to sit at the table to sit down with almost anyone who's already an activist. That's almost true in online spaces as well for like leftism. Um, thankfully, in my interactions, I've not seen people like. That's a lie. Uh, I have seen people kind of like gatekeep as well, but we shouldn't. It, like no one has to read Marx at all to be a leftist or be anti-capitalist. Uh, I mean, if you need to like read someone in order to be identified as like something, I would say that like a, I would think a Marxist would lead, at least need to read some Marx. I imagine that's true of like um, Leninists, and they need to read some Lenin. I mentioned that, like, people who are Maoists, they probably did read some of Mao's work. I don't agree with Leninists or Maoists. Yeah, I'm an anarchist. As, but for, like, other old leftists, no, you don't have to read any, anything, honestly. I think it's a good idea to consume theory, but you don't necessarily have to read it. Just like there are YouTube videos, there are audiobooks, there are other ways to consume it other than, like, reading and... Yeah, it's honestly, a lot of people don't feel the need to like read the theory of like Marx, Marx to understand how shitty their life is. They are just being, they have the boot of like like capitalism on the hit, on their necks for their entire lives. They still feel that oppression that the theory is explaining. So they have like firsthand experience of like their um the oppression that usually will make them anarchists or make them leftists usually. Mm. At least my phone I probably should like mute that in case I get any more um things. So no no not that. There we go. Okay, you gotta remember to unmute it after the stream though. Um, right, right. I don't. It's. I think this is important to consume. But even though I say it's important to consume theory, some theory, not necessarily a lot, but some, and. And what theory? That's a good the question, and that's a debate all on its own. Um, but it's important to consume some theory to, and know some of the aspects and some of the thoughts of things. Um, is it important? Is it necessary to call yourself a leftist to consume theory? I say no. I don't want to get deep too much. I think it's like. Green with certain principles, but like this kind of like thing, and making it, it you have to order to be an activist to be sitting at the table is like something that we should not do. And I just remembered uh, something else. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, um, just remembered, 
and something. Probably should like say these things. <laughs> that I say I'm live, but also another thing is that um, I should put into the live chat. Sorry for the um. <laughs> Uh, but this uh, stream is live. I'm doing that 20 minutes uh, uh, in, but still. Okay. Um. Respond later. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, not running another game that makes it so that like I have no frame drops whatsoever. Uh, but yeah, so back to the book, the criticism of like, activist cultures, and I think a lot of the problems that like uh, neighbor labor is echoing from like New um is kind of like still prevalent today. White people. White people. Um, Anarchist culture was choking the promise of the movement, and anarchists had to make up their minds of what they really want to do. Create a tiny, relatively privileged community of their own, show up at IMF meetings and make grand declarations about the idea of global capitalism, or make a serious effort to work within real communities who were already bearing the brunt of like, capitalist globalization. Yeah. This is honestly a conflict for me because, like, I I do want like, I I help I held myself back from like helping out in real communities and in for uh, various different reasons. One, I work a lot, uh, but also it's just like I don't is I feel bad for the saying this, but it's like I want to help out my friends, but my friends are in Minnesota or in Indiana or in like Maryland, and and helping out locally is something I should do, and I advocate for people to do that. But by doing that as well, um, well, uh, is I'm neglecting it, it, is if I do, it'll, it'll, it'll help out my local communities. I feel like I'm not helping out like my friends over in Minnesota, over in Indiana, over in like Maryland, over in other places. It's that weird kind of like thing of connectivity of like um in online. I know I have so many online friends, but they're not local. So if I help out locally, I'm in doing what's an important work and good work to do. But yet I also want to help out directly for my online friends. So I guess it's just like why I decided to like do more of like these sort of things with my free time, whatever free time I have, instead of like local activism. I, f I feel guilty about this too, essentially, yes. Uh, you can't be an anarchist in a big city in America without hearing some version of this critique on a fairly regular basis. In part, this is because it's critiques that need to be like made. Much of, like the SES uh, activists described in the last chapter, a few white participants in direct action movements see themselves as coming from cultures. Most see themselves as simply generic, unmarked Americans, the kind of whose issues and concerns are treated as universal, even if at the same time they feel there is something about the that genetic, gen, gen, no, generic, generic American way of life that is deeply inhuman, unsustainable, and wrong. As anarchists and revolutionaries, therefore, they are faced with the same dilemma. Whether they try to create an alternative culture of their own or to concentrate on alliance works, supporting the struggle for those who like suffer um, most under the existing system, but who are also willing to like work with them as allies. To put it crudely, they have to like choose between whether to focus on their own alienation or or other suppressions. I mean, I guess, I guess I want to focus on my own alienation sometimes, but I, it, uh, but yet I more focus on like other suppressions. But it's not like others in the local community is other people I know online. So I feel this. So stop distracting myself. So 
certainly in reality, almost everyone ends up doing a little of both. But both, but this is precisely what leads to exactly the contradiction Ranjit uh, Ran uh, Ran Ran was uh, pointing to. I kind of like stick to the pronunciation, just stick with it. Uh, the more one creates one's own alienated alternate culture, the more bizarrely and outlandish one seems to outsiders, the, they included those uh, with whom one ostracizes, ostentatiously wishes to a lot. Many people of color see anarchist culture itself as a badge of white privilege being waved in their face. Fair. Um, as a... As a African American anarchist remarks in regards to punk style of crow, uh, clothes, address, and compartmentalist, if I would uh, went out on the streets looking like that, I'd be dragged down to the police shop in 15 minutes. Yeah, it's kind of a white privilege to uh, say I'm an anarchist. I'm an anarchist. I'm an anarchist. I fucking do that too. I have leggings that uh, have the A symbol. Um, Let's see, do I have a one nearby? Um, um, yeah. Yes. I mean, when I received some like great call offs to like uh, cover myself for like COVID, I put the I put the anarchist symbols in, in red and black on them. I'm proudly wearing to myself as aesthetic. Oh, I'm an anarchist. And yeah, that's probably is a white privilege for sure. I should be aware of that. On the other hand, it seems unreasonable to ask anarchists to abandon all attempts to build alternative cultures, to fall back on a way of life they hate, it just as not to put off, put off others. But can one really be against a culture? This is a question I want to explore in this chapter. Culture is a term with such a, it's universal positive associations nowadays, it's already slightly odd to like, hear that... Uh, the fact that certain people have a culture is treated as a problem, or the mo all the more so when the culture in question is born of a consistent effort to create a less hierarchical, less alienated, and more democratic and ecological, sustainable form of life. To create a kind of culture that might be befit a genuine free society, it seems to me unrivaling this paradox will bring us to the core of the fundamental dilemmas of the anarchist project. Mm, yep. Yeah. This hot water and leaf tea juice um, was no longer hot, so it's kind of like, that. Yeah, better just drink it now before it gets worse. Dilemmas of white privilege. This I have to very read very open mindedly and and listen to the words. Uh, most often, activist seems uh, activist culture is seen as problematic, as it was f for Renjenif. Uh, because it is it is seen as a form of white privilege, and arguments about uh, activist culture are framed in terms of race, um, Americans' radical divisions have, of course, been the scorn of radical politics in the United States for centuries. And I think David Graeber would also like acknowledge that, like he is a white person, and as well, he's actually Jewish though. But like, it's Jewish people being racialized. It depends where you are. Um, maybe not so much in America, maybe in Europe, I forgot which. It, it could be either way. It, it Honestly, it depends on who you ask. Are Jewish people white? Depends. Uh, historically, they... Uh, have made the maintenance of ongoing class-based alliances extraordinarily difficult. Arguments like this regularly rip uh, direct action groups apart. Let me consider one particular well-documented example in the 1990s. The Love and Rage Federation, Filipino uh, 1933, 1993, uh, dissolve over issues of white privilege. Love and Rage has begun as an initiative to create a contention a continental anarchist network around a newspaper of the same name. In many ways, it was a great success. Quite, it was quite successful. After ten years, however, they found themselves stubbornly unable to expand beyond their original core of middle-class white activists, or including a significant number of people of color. And now here we have the note twenty-seven. Yes, uh, they did achieve a Mexican chapter, Armenia, Armen Y Rabenia. But its members were largely middle class in origin. 
uh, furious arguments uh, ultimately broke out over the reasons for this, uh, which also became a theoretical debate about the nature of white privilege and ways of overcoming white supremacy. Think about this as well, is that, like, in order to do activism as in the real life as war, one has to, like, have the time to do that. And who has the privilege to have the time to do that? And while well, struggling to survive. I can imagine that there's, like, a lot of middle-class white people that, uh, or just a lot of middle-class people, honestly. I, but majority of middle-class people be middle-class white people, especially in certain areas. And so they wouldn't have the, the time to do, like, the 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 participation and the activism that's described in the activism culture. So that already kind of, like, keeps people uh, um, away from, like, being able to, like, uh, participate in those things. And that's why I think it kind of also feels exclusionary so well. Which is an unfortunate problem. I just don't have the answers of how to fix that. Um, some argue that the problem was cultural. The vast majority of white anarchists first discovered anarchism through punk rock and its DOI culture. Uh, walk into a typical anarchist info shop and they point out and you will also inevitably be greeted by people with green hair and facial piercings. It doesn't matter how welcoming they are, This their very appearance obviously limits the appeal of such places to members of the white working class, and let alone poor people of color. Others argue that the problem lies much deeper. The U.S., they argue, is a nation built on white supremacy and, white, and whiteness is not a culture. Agreed. The nation, this nation, the United States, was built on, a, on, the, on white supremacy. Is built, this was built on the um, slaughter of indigenous people and stealing of their lands, uh, and and that the and us celebrating that genocide is like the reason for the national holiday of Thanksgiving, which is coming up this Thursday as I record this, <laughs> and. It's, um, it, I think if, if things are still locked down from COVID, uh, where the ca- number of cases in COVID is like increasing in into a higher peak than like before, even like in March or, or in April, even in June or in July, we're reaching higher numbers, and so so a lot of states are just like who are running out of ICU beds themselves, or running or getting near capacity. They are just locking down um, everything. As were, and people just have to stay home. So, th- so I think there will be less people uh, traveling to Thanksgiving dinners. There will still some people that are, will do that. And it's just like, and we don't stop people in America from doing that. That's just what we don't do. Oh, um, and uh, but I, I am kind of grateful, though, in some regards of the COVID thing that don't have to do with the Thanksgiving main dinner sort of thing. I love my family, you know, except for my younger brother, who's a gamer gator and Trump supporter or, and a bigot. But I love my family. In, but it's still, this holiday is the whole day Thanksgiving is just a celebration of genocide against indigenous people. That's how I see it. And I, was, I won't be silent about that, too. I'll find out to say it like that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and whiteness is not a culture. I agree. We just ban whiteness. Just can- uh, cancel white people. Yes, let's just cancel sit that white men too as well. Um, when white people you know, talk about their cultural heritage, they talk about being German or Irish or Lithuanian, but never about whiteness. That's because whiteness is a category of privilege, a, ta- uh, a tangent or agreement with other categories as white. Hey, from home loan owners uh, association or police superintendents to provide aid and protection that is not provided to those not so classified. The only way to destroy the system of privilege is to subvert the category of whiteness as, as so as to do ultimately destroy. This was a position uh, being uh, developed in circles surrounding the journal uh, Race Trader, which launched around the time and, and avidly read in activist circles. Thank you for following. Um, Biden over Trump, uh, that's because like Trump's a fascist and like Biden's just a neoliberal. 
I wasn't happy with, like, Biden being the nominee, honestly. I'll be the first to complain about, like, hey, Biden's, like, long history, so it were. But, like, uh, he's better than Trump, but so is a toaster. In a ways, yes, I'm glad Trump is gone, but, like, and in a ways, I'm glad that Trump is gone, but otherwise, just, like, I... Uh, I, we're going to have like Biden. Yes, the return to normalcy of his like the Obama years, but Obama years weren't great. Uh, thank you for the follow, though. Um, yeah, Biden did. Um, well, yeah, he the most he did about like being the civil rights activist that like he just like um, he lifeguard at a swimming pool for a summer in. In a, a neighborhood predominantly of people of color in Delaware in the 60s. That's about it. But uh, yeah, Biden's a racist and a sexual assaulter. Um, that's kind of like the uh, topic of like of the the thing that's just kind of kind of out of nowhere. But I like to uh, keep the conversation from the live chat to be kind of like focused more or less tangentially at least to the topic at hand. Um. Yeah, speaking of which, we're talking about like the uh, defunct or maybe defunct journal of like race trader. Where was I? Yeah, which launched around the time and, and avidly read in Anglican journals. Its motto was uh, "Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity." I agree. This was a very appealing notion, but the obvious question then became: How does one actually do that? How does one become an effective race trader? Who might be a example of an effective role model? Many in love and range found inspiration in the uh, example of the uh, sub. Commandant uh, Marcos, uh, the famous uh, Mar Max spokesperson of the Mexican Zapatista. Oh, by the way, mm. you're pretty sad Trump is gone? Why? Anyway, uh, back to the topic at hand. Um, uh, I am reading that, so you can like uh, read along with me. Just like uh, uh, check out that anarchist uh, library page. Uh, it's, it, I'm in, in chapter six, where it's uh, kind of like page three. Ish out of like 47. Uh, this is the chapter covering um, uh, some criticisms of activism culture, as it were. Mainly, it's just like mostly like white. And so I'll continue. Um, let's see, also, who might be the effective role? As uh, Marcos, the famous uh, Marcos was originally a middle class uh, Mexican who led a group of mostly privileged urban revolutionaries to organize indigenous cultures in Jesta, and after 10 years in the jungle, came to abandon his vanguard ideology in order to become an agent carrying out decisions made by the indigenous cultures. Okay. Um, that's a way to go, actually. Um, because definitely, uh, we should like hey, listen to the um to the most vulnerable uh, people in the area in the community, hey, and the indigenous cultures in like uh, Latin America and Mexico are probably are so, uh, among the most uh, marginalized and vulnerable. Um, his in his willingness to step back and accept the leaderships of oppressed communities, he could be considered an example of a genuine race traitor. That's, uh, um, please get the uh, conversation and on the topic at hand. And I don't want to, like, I, I just spend the whole time talking about Trump. If I was talking about, like, maybe criticism of Biden or criticism of Obama, then, yeah, that'll be, um, maybe it's time to bring up, like, from Trump. But fuck Trump. Trump is a fascist. Or, like, a pseudo-fascist. They definitely want to be a fascist dictator. Yeah, I'm just glad that, like, he finally conceded so that, like, and, and hopefully we can, like, now have that peaceful transition, as it were, because, like, and fuck Trump supporters, too. No, I hate them. It's just, like, because if the, you are supporting Trump, you are supporting pseudo-fascists. If you're supporting the GOP, you're supporting a fascist uh, a political party, because there are some GOP members who are actually literally fascists, like Steve King. All right, I'm done with you. Yeah, if you're a Trump supporter, you're just getting bad. 
if you speak the praises of Trump, I'm sorry. No. I spend too much time on folks on you. Thank you for the follow, though, but no. I do not welcome Trump supporters into you know, my channel. I'm a queer person, and many of my friends who are queer or in of different marginalized communities. Trump was absolutely terrible to those communities. Yeah. And Trump enacted genocide on, on people, which is still going on, can still continue with the concentration camps. So, yes. Uh, where was I? Uh, but Marcus, for his part, had taken advantage of uh, being able to ally with indigenous com uh, uh, communities that already acted very uh, much like anarchists, with their own styles of consensus-based direct democracy. What does this mean for anarchists in the United States, where most revolutionary groups based in communities of color were far more hierarchical organized, where, where in fact, many saw emphasis on direct democracy as itself a form of white privilege? Yeah, I can see that. Um, would all this means having to abandon any ideas of building a new society in the shell of the old? Or at least of uh, you know, white anarchists uh, playing any significant role in the process of doing so? Within a year or two, love and rage split into a like, feuding factions over racial issues and, and the entire uh, project ultimately floundered. I guess and maybe yeah, is uh, direct democracy can be seen as a form of right privilege, is because like everyone else is just focusing on surviving, and it's like to just like in um sorry to bother you, uh, what is a white voice of uh, the voice of someone who doesn't have his bill who has all his bills paid in the privileged position that he like, doesn't have to worry about uh can he afford rent or mortgage or can he afford or this the the meals for next month he has all that taken care. of of and that is typically a white person so yeah i can definitely see like I mean, this too uh they it, it would be like someone like me who's uh, benefits from the current system as it is more or less um and and probably i did benefit on their trump as well but fuck trump um and so me advocating for direct no actually might be a form of white privilege but anyway Continuing on, uh, similar debates erupted in the earlier days of the globalization movement. In the, this case, the kickoff was a piece called uh, "Where's the Where Was the Color in Seattle?" Martinez, two thousand, that sparked con continuous arguments about the nature of racial privilege, outreach versus alliances models, and how to accept the leadership of communities of color. About this. Sh Style, uh, the stifling effects of white guilt, the overwhelming white makeup of emerging movements was felt to be a constant, a continuous uh, crisis. Certainly, this was the new true of New York Direct Action Network. Dan, uh, originally founded to help coordinate the actions against the IMF and World Bank in Washington in April 16, 2000, Dan's second major initiative was to help organize actions against the Republican Convention in Philadelphia that summer. In in order to do so, a group of Dan organizers proposed to ally with SLAM. Ooh. It's raining. I am in the Seattle area. It's going to be raining. Last. Ooh, SLAM. Students Liberation Activist Movement. Nice. Again, that's a, that's a good acronym, too. A radical student group based at Hunterton College with a much more diverse membership and several other POC. Okay, got them sneeze. Sorry about that. No. In those days, in the in the immediate wake of Seattle, everyone was eager to learn Dan's tactics and forms an organization. So the latter was not uh, adverse, but they also insisted that the actions themselves focus on the case of Mar 
Mama Abu Jamal, the black activist and journalist, and then on death row in Philadelphia, and more broadly on the U.S. personal industrial complex and racial uh, nature of the criminal justice system. These demands absolutely significant faction in Dan, who have seen the convention protests as a, a chance to move from issues of global trade to broader uh, challenges to existing political system as a whole, to juxtapose their own, own model of direct action to kind of corporate dominated so as representative democracy emboldened by the conventions. Some felt that like the two were reconcilable and that prison and death penalties issues could be used ultimately to raise the same any broader questions. Others felt that the compromise was worth the opportunity to create an ongoing alliance. In the end, the effort did not, in fact, led to ongoing alliances and resulting recriminalization caused a number of activists to give up on Dan entirely. However, the alliance, however temporary, was quite helpful in disseminating Dan-like tactics and styles of decision-making and even anarchist ideals themselves in a wider activist circle. Shortly after NYC Dan effectively dissolved in 2003, a new anarchist of pe anarchist people of color network, APOC, was in the process of taking shape based on almost identical organization principles. Ah. Uh. The early experience of APOC, however, already provides an excellent illustration of why direct action oriented groups had tended to dominate by people classified as white. When those who lay, lack white privilege uh, began to adopt such politics, they found that they faced a completely different levels of police suppression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they they target POC people more often than they target like white people. As per, as one particularly startling uh, incident in Brooklyn revealed, APAC couldn't even throw a benefit party in their own offices without having to worry about local police sweeping in and beat up and arresting party goers taken to on the streets. That is certainly a white privilege to just like be able to hold events as it were. So true today, which is why the police uprising that we have now. All of this was perhaps predictable. It is a notorious thing that uh, during larger scale actions, police seem to target people of color for particular violence. As a result, many non-anarchist POC activist groups see direct action itself as a form of radical privilege, and made a good, great point of trying to keep those likely to engage in militant tactics away from their events. The short-lived uh, Los Angeles Dan, was, which organized the protests against the Democratic Convention in 2000, took the need to ally with communities so seriously that they refused to allow their spaces to be used for anarchist meetings at all, and even employed marshals to exclude black block anarchists from their marches. Mm. Uh. That's interesting. That was their decision, but it's just like, um, I guess it may be the, maybe the cons of like the privileged white people that were participating in anarchist black block was, it, it was outweighed from the benefit of having black block at, at your march. Because, uh, and I guess, and I guess it's probably not necessary to have black box since it is the Democratic Convention as opposed to the Republican National Convention. So, and this was in 2000 when we didn't have a, much of a serious threat of like um, a rise of fascism that we have now. Again, we can thank Trump for the rise of fascism. Uh, people still vote for him though, 70 million. So there's a lot of so either they're, they're not all of them are just like raging like MAGA like Trump supporters to their death and like well thus be basically fascist sympathizers at least, uh, but a lot of them are seen are probably like uh, privileged white people that like don't like buying them raising their taxes. That is seriously the only reason one person I know or a, f the, a family member, a friend of mine, I mean, that's seriously the only reason that family member voted for Trump over Biden because Biden's going to raise his taxes. It's just like, if you're voting for Trump, you're voting for misogyny, racism, white supremacy, ableism, and 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 queer and and queer bigotry, homo big, homophobia, and trans bigotry, all that sort of stuff. 
Uh, and yet you are fine with all of that just because at least Trump won't raise your taxes. Fuck you for that, then. Um, New York game was very different. To all intents and purposes, it was itself an anarchist group. Still, it quickly found itself in trouble for its refusal to take the same path as L.A. Dan. Immediately after A16, uh, this was like a, a code for a date uh, that was mentioned in the preface on the introduction. Um, uh, that's no longer on my Twitch channel, that reading, that stream, but it's on my YouTube channel, which you can like find here for those who are still here. I will be putting up more of my uh, VODs uh, up on my uh, YouTube channel. I really got to like get, get doing that. And I'm working on it. So um, more of these videos will be up there. And I'll put it all in the playlist as well. Uh, and an allied group... Dan, uh, NYC Dan and an allied group, New York Reclaimed the Streets, joined with several Mexican immigrants groups to organize a May Day march through Lower Manhattan. It was to be an entirely peaceful, indeed permitted, event. Uh, repeal it with... Uh, repeal it? With musical bands and giant puppets. Still, as the marchers first assembled at Union Square, a tiny cluster of perhaps 16 anarchists in black box appeared, uh, simply t intending to show the flag, as it were, and establish a overtly anarchist presence at the event. Before the march even started, police swooped in and arrested about a dozen of them. Now, no 29. And they were held on the basis of a absurd early 19th century mask law originally passed to suppress Irish highwaymen which made it illegal for any member of a group of more than three people assembled in a public uh, public in public to disguise their faces the block has actually been warned of this but have been falsely advised that if they were slogans written on their masks, they could not be held accountable. But that just shows you that the police were just going to use any obscure laws to just arrest people if they want to arrest people. It also is just like, unfortunately, it sometimes, and this is how some people got radicalized, they actually just look at the, a lot of laws of a lot of city ordinances and it's like, why this, why did this Occupy movement up in Saskatchewan or like at Saskatoon or Regina, why did that get like, um, and why did the police come in and like uh, arrest people and take care of that? And, and they've, and then someone found out that's like, oh wait, it's because of obscure law that basically said it gave the police the power to determine if someone's breaking the law or not. They have that authority. Actually, the agency, the ordinance gives them that authority. And that's when the person is like, well, fuck this then. The police can just decide who they want to arrest or at, at any given time. <laughs> yes, that's pretty much how the police act as it is, which is why I say all cops are bad and all cops are bastards. I mean, maybe it's better in like Germany or like in other places, but like, actually I know someone in France and, then, and she was like, no, the police are bastards. All police are bastards. Anyway, um, the Mexican organizers were outraged, but uh, less at the police than at their fellow, their Dan fellow organizers, accusing them of putting their people, many of them undocumented workers, at, at risk of being at risk by allowing a black bloc to assemble to begin with. They swore never to work with Dan again. I wouldn't blame these. I wouldn't blame them, especially since it's like it is a huge. It, uh, the risk for me if I get arrested. It was. I mean, worst case scenario, I would get, uh, may lose my job, and that would be devastating, because I have a lot of credit card debt, I have to, like, get on unemployment, or find another job, and, like, it might not be good for me, or a good fit for me, or just, like, I won't be able to do as much, won't be able to make as much, and I have to, like, struggle just to, like, pay off my credit cards. And then won't be able to help um, my friends as much. So that will be difficult for me, for sure. Um, but then, um, but for like a you know, document person, they could get deported. So it is a higher risk um, for some people to get arrested than it is for me. Hell, I'm, again, I'm white. I may be like let go and released from jail the next day, and I have support network uh, of like a family to be able to help me uh, if I like need a ride, maybe need some bail or anything like that. But like people of color, they generally speaking don't have that support network, and like in um, 
undocumented workers, they would have a much it's a much higher risk for them to do it. So, I think this does speak to like a, uh, to the point that like uh, it's pretty much a white privilege uh, in activist culture or activist culture. It's a white privilege it's because yeah, it's the risk is not as high for their white for white people as for, for others. It's pretty obvious that when police launch preemptive strikes like this, fomenting uh, fermenting the, the divisions of this sort is half the point. The NYPD uh, has uh, actually provided a remarkable attempt at playing this sort of game, and has in fact made a habit during particularly sensitive marches organized by POC groups of napping one or two white anarchists on uh, trumped-up charges. A year after the May Day march, during a march repealing for clemency of our Native American activist Leonard Pradella in December 2000. For instance, a NYPD snatch squad suddenly broke out in the middle of a march to tackle and drag away four unmasked anarchists. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. Um, one was charged with... Okay, I'm going to sneeze. fix it i just blew my nose um one was charged with position and of a battery app operated megaphone without a sound permit the other was resisting arrest this was a very delicate issue and everyone was making an that's a word i'm not familiar with i'm going to open up a new window come on right click like that should have set this up beforehand it's on uh, again, this is what you should read. You find you are learning new words. Come on, load up and open up the new window. I thought I clicked on that. It's like, my computer's being slow again. Yep, and now I got two tabs. Okay, close one of them. What's the word I want to look up? And I can't, I, I've tried. I can't really just like, in other places, I can just like highlight it and copy and then and paste it. Uh, but I, I think I could, and, and no, sounding things out doesn't work for me. I'm dyslexic. I mouth because dyslexia is just like not helpful. Okay, let's go to Webster then. Because uh, I want to know what, uh, how to pronounce this word for sure. Uh, Strenuous. Strenuous. I knew that word, just never seen written. Ah. Ah. I uh, don't know. Click on that, click on that, click on that, and now click on that. A very delicate issue, and everyone was making strenuous efforts to avoid anything that could be interpreted as a provocation. None of the none of the activists were wearing masks, and the women with the megaphone and had not, in fact, been using it, but simply carrying it uh, from one permit permitted rally point to another. And anyway, as many pointed out, there's no such thing as a moving sound permit. Still, the fact that everyone knew that the arrests were a pretext and con consensus and consciously intended to slow dissension, dissension uh, didn't really matter. Afterwards, many activists who, who based their strategy on building alliances with POC groups, including, in this case, several former members of Love and Rage and now turned Maoist, argued that this the very presence of black-clad anarchists could itself be considered a provocation. As a result, such activists often ended up challenging the very principles of direct a action. Such activists ended up uh, challenging the often ended up challenging the very principles of direct action. And and this is and direct act, and this is what this whole book's about, direct action. Uh once I get finished this section and get to this section, I'll take a break. And make myself some more tea. Um whatever the underlying reason though, uh there is one thing that is it's cruel to emphasize. Groups like Dan are largely white. Particularly striking was the absence of African Americans. For most of its history, NYC Dan has a single black member in an active core of about 50. That is not to say that it was anything like exclusively white. There were always a fair number of like Latinos, though more likely to be from countries like Brazil or Argentina than say Mexico or Puerto Rico, and even larger number of activists of South. 
or East Asia, uh, Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean, or Middle Eastern, Turkish, in, in, Egyptian, uh, Iranian descent. Still, their numbers all put together rarely come um, to more than a third of the active membership. As for the rest, if they did anything, if they had any self-conscious uh, eth eth ethnic identity, it was most likely to be Jewish or Irish. While Dan was certainly more diverse than, say, earlier SDS, uh, in a city as diverse as New York, this was considered a matter of scandal. Um, so... We're now at a good stopping point. We're now at the next section, dilemmas of privilege and that are not necessarily racial. Oh, okay. This is a very important get to. Maybe we'll get to like um, some of the privileges I have because like I'm I'm not a cis person, but uh, and I'm not straight. I'm polysexual actually, but I am cis hep. I'm cis passing, and if I'm with like a girl or a femme presenting in person, or another cis um female or cis woman presenting person, then I would be have like. A hat present thing as well, um, uh, but I'm of course also still white as well, and so I have a lot. Of, but like we're talking about privilege that's not racialized, which also made me also because of my family origins and like my family structure and my support network as well. That's a form of privilege for sure. Uh, but now uh, we're going to do a self care break, so we're just going to go into self care. Uh, I still don't have music because, like, I I want to find music that I know for sure. No, oh, actually, I edited out the breaks on like uh, YouTube, but still, I, I I don't have music. I haven't like set up a bot or a like ticker or anything like that to uh, play music. So unfortunately, when you are you come back to the break, it will be on my. I am going to make sure to actually transition over to the be right back. Uh, uh, screen because before because the other day uh not yesterday i think it was sunday uh, i did tra meant to transition to the be right back screen i actually then transition over to the starting soon screen but now i'm for sure transitioning to the uh, be right back scene but get some snacks uh, if you haven't eaten anything, um, ref top up your drinks or get a drink of water. Go get up and stretch. Uh, use the facilities if you need to. Um, do all the uh, take your medications if you haven't and you need to. Uh, check uh, to take your meds. Get some water. Get some snacks. Uh, get up and stretch. Get up and use the bathroom. And we're we'll going to drench it like that. And I'm going to make myself a new cup of tea and be right back. Okay, I'm finally going to like transition back. Uh, I also have to remember or er, when I'm editing out these breaks, it's just like actually edit out the unnecessary parts of it. I only keep in the time so I'm actually doing analysis. I'm like reading uh, from the book, and and not and, and, and like keeping all the times so that like there's like sound as it were. But anyway. Uh, uh, I now have my like hot water leaf juice. It's orange spice. Ooh, it's good. And then we're going to continue on uh, reading in uh, chapter six of like direct action iconography. Um, some criticisms of activist uh, culture. And now uh, we covered the dilemmas of white privilege and now the dilemmas of privilege that aren't uh, necessarily racial. I will be returning to specifically racial issues periodically. They are the bane of all racial politics in North America. What I want to emphasize here is these this these dilemmas are not simply effects of racism. It's simply dilemmas cropped up whenever one has a movement trying to combat the situations of extreme social inequality. Always, those on the bottom who have the most reason to want to challenge such inequalities will also tend to have the most restricted range of weapons at their disposal which what, uh, with which to do so. Inevitably, this causes endless moral dilemmas for those who privilege and actually allow them to rebel. This is not a new phenomenon. There is a vast in, in literature on the subject. Eric Wolf, uh, 1969, for example, pointed out that in every peasant revolt we know about, the backbone of guerrilla armies is always the middle 
pe uh, peasantry. Uh, since the poorest stratum uh, lacks the means to carry out substantial insurrection, and the wealthiest uh, lack motivation. Similarly, E. B. Uh, Thompson, 1971, and others have demonstrated that the mainstays of early modern bread riots in reality, events very like of what we now call uh, direct action, tend to hail from the most prosperous among the laboring classes. Neither bourgeoisie nor paupers, but members of the respectable working class. In fact, much of the early literature on radical movements seemed to argue that it was impossible for the truly oppressed to become genuine revolutionaries. Carl Manhattan uh, met him in uh, 1929, also Norman Cohen in uh, 1957, for example, argued that not only do they the, do the truly oppressed tend to engage in sustained revolt, their mode of imagining social alternatives tend to be absolute and malingering. Yeah? What? I don't know that word. What does that mean? What? Uh, audio unavailable? What? Let's go to Webster then. DuckDuckGo didn't have the audio for how to pronounce that word, but uh, Webster does. Millenarian. Millenarian. Of or relating to belief in a millennium. Huh. Interesting word. Okay. Um, also, it's a good thing that I'm not muted. It kind of helps to, like, um, make sure that that's the case. Uh, while the middle stratum was decisively itself through, it, uh, disciplining itself through a, con a consensus self cumulation which regarded ethics and intellectual culture as a its principal self justification, 1929, 73, uh, and were developing rational utopias, the truly marginal tended to favor a kind of ecstatic, ecstatic version of sudden and total um, rapture. Rupture. Manhattan, Manhattan called this chinoism. A mental structure particular to oppressed peasants, journeymen, and intimate lumpen proletariat, and fantastically emotional preachers. Uh, 1929 to uh, 2003. Let's check out this note. Uh, interesting, it was the letter. Constitutionists uh, who have traditionally written off as anarchists. Interesting. Hence, when the poorest elements did rise up, they tend to do so in the name of some great millennium uh, vision uh, and the belief. Hold on, let's, let's hear it again and uh, pronounce that word. Millenarian. Millenarian. I'll have to probably listen to that a couple of times before I like and remember it. Um, hence, when the poorest elements did rise up, they tend to do so in the name of some great millenarian vision and the belief that the world as we know it it would soon come to an end. That's kind of how I feel in one blow, and existing hierarchies be swept away. I kind of knew that that won't be true, but it, because even if I we get rid of like the state and capitalism, we'll still have white supremacy, still have like uh, ableism, cis hetero patriarchy, and it's going to take a lot of work to like dismantle all of those. It's constant work too. Now, while a you know, few nowadays would uh, give much credence to the idea that the poor uh, live in an internal you know, pleasant present or are incapable of such long-term plans, Manhattan does has something of a point. Revolutionary movements have always tended to take on uh, much uh, of their temperance and direction of those very middle strata. At the very least, there has always been like something of a gap in those respects between those who suffer the most in the in an unequal society and those most able to organize effective, sustained oppositions in. Uh, opposition. In other words, those most affected, as the current activist catchphrase puts it, by feudal or capitalist structures rarely, if ever, organize openly against it. I can see why.
It's a little hot right now, but uh, it's fine. One can argue, like Jim, uh, Jim Scott in uh, 1982 and 1992, thank Jim Scott's, uh, yeah, some of Jim Scott's books is actually on the Anarchist Library, um, that the hidden resistance of the lower uh, lowly is a great unrecognized force in world history, and surely one would be right, but rarely does this resistance take the form of overt rebellion. Windows, disjunctions, and superimpose over more profound prescriptions of differences like race, culture, ethnicity, they become far more visible. But it seems to me that they are always going to be like in some form or another. They're simply one of those inevitable side effects of social inequality. Note number 31. Uh, all of this sounds a little like the famous political science n n notion of the middle third of the population, which is you can either identify its interest with the wealthy third uh, above them, or in creating a conservative majority, or with the poor third below, creating a progressive one. I think the tendency to reduce such a social stratifications to a simple matter of wealth, or even power, is a bit decis decisive. And that it makes more sense to start from terms I begin to develop above. Hello, Taffy. I need to look at the relations between those who are revolting mainly against oppression and those revolting mainly against alienation. I'll develop these arguments further in a bit. For now, though, before turning to activist cultures in more detail, I have better addressed the frequent accusations that activists themselves, with those in the globalization movement in particular, are in, a gen in the general scones of a political class, a privileged, of a privileged class. Now, Taffy is lurking, and the sleepy lurkins awake alive and should make food. Go make food, Taffy. I'll give you a shout out. Even though it's just like, maybe it's just like, yeah. Hey, it's you, me, maybe one other guy that just followed that I banned, and. Oh, yeah, that's right. Stream Labs might be counting as a viewer. Huh! Uh, but still, I'll give you a shout out as well, especially since these these videos do go up to my YouTube channel and people will be able to see it right now because I remembered to refresh the chat box. I didn't do that on Sunday. Or did. Was, no, yesterday. That was yesterday. I didn't refresh the chat box. And I was I expected the chat box to be there, but now the chat box is there. So there you go. There's the shout out. And you're welcome, of course, Tabby. Hmm. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. I spent too much time talking to that person, too. Um, of course, in the case of globalization movement, one common popular perception is that we are not even talking about members of a middle strata, and about but about members of the elite. This idea has become so deeply entrenched, in fact, that it has become a common wisdom not only among conservative commentators, but to some degree to the public more generally. Before going on... Um, and then, then let's briefly take on this perception, one which is, of course, a social phenomenon in its own right. Mmm. I, I, I also do appreciate that this David Graeber does kind of like is looking at the critiques of the socialist culture as well, since he is an anthropologist. I, I like, I'm interested in that kind of like field myself, as it were. Because a lot of anthropologists tend to become anarchists, as were as neighbors and grapers they said that his own experience solidified his uh, his uh, position of anarchism. He was always like interested in it and came from a working class family, and like his uncle was actually uh, part of the like uh, Spanish Revolution in like n the, during the Spanish Civil War in Catalonia between 1936 and 1939. So he kind of learned about like anarchism from that, but he didn't realize that no, it can actually work until he went to Madagascar. But anyway. He wrote about his experience in Madagascar in another book, um, and he mentions it a lot in a lot of his talks and in a lot of other places, but I think I'm just going to continue on reading and with the myth of trust funds. The stereotype runs something like this. The core of the anti-globalization movement is made up of rich, upper-middle-class teenagers, trust fund babies, who can afford to spend their time traveling from summit to summit and making trouble. In a way, the accusation was predictable enough. Right-wing populism in the U.S. is largely based on the accusation that liberals are part of an upper-middle-class elite 
whose values are deeply alien to that of the working class Americans. It would be hardly surprising that, faced with leftist radicals, uh, the first instinct of right-wing talk radio hosts would be to assume that if liberals were drawn from the preposterous, revolutionaries would have to be drawn from the actual rich. Preposterous, I think that pronounced it correctly. Anyway, on the other hand, if one examines the records, one finds some of the first figures to make such claims. This was around the time of the Republican and Democratic National Conventions uh, in the summer of 2000. Uh, note number 32. Um, R2K and D2K... Propos... Propos... Pro persoas wealthy. Okay. The brain. Uh, I'll probably I'll probably figure it out uh, later, or if I get struggle with it again, I'll just like listen to Webster dictionary uh, pronunciation of it. Um, in activist parlance, or in their combined, yeah, words on a pain in the form R two D two. R2-D2. I mean, I had the hat right there. <laughs> Thank you, Tevi. Unfortunately, I have been uh, unable to track the actual names of most of those who like, made such claims, and uh, therefore forced to rely on my own, and no doubt imperfect, uh, memory of the time. Okay. Were figures of authorities in like the cities expecting protests? For example, the mayor of L.A. and Philadelphia's police chief uh, John Tum uh, uh, Timothy, in a tone that it certainly implies access to some kind of uh, actual sociological information they could not uh, pros possibly had. Um, these were, in fact, the very political uh, figures who immediately followed afterwards ordered uh, police to attack uh, what what even by convention definitions were largely non-violent protesters. It certainly gives one and reason to wonder, especially since so many police in Seattle had the first balk when given similar orders. Imagine that, actually, Seattle Police Department actually balking at, like, orders like that. Uh, I wonder how many actually, like, listen... WTO writes in Seattle something I want to like, um, look into uh, again because I remember hearing the, watching the news reports of it. And I had my liberal frame of mind from the mainstream media to like view those events, but um, I want to see uh, um, look at those events again now with my leftist frame of mind. Anyway, uh, given the fact that a whole series of like other rumors seem to mysteriously appear around the same time about activists, about activists attacking police with acid and urine, Mm. One would on, one can only wonder whether this was part of a more calculated campaign to appeal to class prejudices of the police themselves. Yeah, uh, the message at the convention and similar mobilizations seemed to be: Do not think of yourself as a working class guy being paid to protect a bunch of bankers, politicians, and trade bureaucrats who have contempt who have contempt for you. Think of this, rather, as an opportunity to beat up on those naughty children. Sorry for my hat to hit my microphone. A understanding which would be, for the politicians' purposes, perfect, since they also did not want the police to actually maim or kill protesters. Yeah, if you give rain for the police to just beat up on people, they'll beat up on people. Especially if you give them a reason to. Um, whether the sort of like an imagery emerges from police intelligence sources, which tend to draw heavily on research units from private security firms and conservative think tanks, and often to reproduce very odd forms of right-wing propaganda, yeah, or whether police were actually listening to the conservative radio hosts, is, at this juncture... Impossible to say. Uh, note number 33. We'll be considering some of these uh, questions further in Chapter 9. Ooh, so let's lift, we'll look forward to that. Sounds like cops in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah.
Ugh. If nothing else, activists at many major summits ever since have regularly reported more or less the same accusation on the part of the police. As one friend summarized it to me, You're all a bunch of rich kids who put on masks so uh, your daddies can't see your faces on the news when you go and smash things up. And then you go home um, to your mansions and watch it, on, uh, watch it all on TV and laugh at us. If nothing else, the rumors became remarkably consistent. The myth of the trust funds. So, who are activists really? 1. Work and education. What follows is not based on statistical methodology of any sort, but having spent over 70 years now amongst anarchists. <laughs> oh my god, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, ah. <sighs> I bet when this book was written at that time, yeah, we would just, like, just assume that, like, they're talking about the elites, they're just talking about the rich people who happen to be, like, liberal or left the center, as it were, and then fund the medias and so like that. But now, like, when they talk about the elites, we're just, like, thinking, oh, you mean Jewish people, don't you? Like, who was funny Antifa? George Soros! And just, like, it's... The, 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 the talking points is always there, they're just now... Uh, and there's, like, under the surface of it, there's, like, a worse subcore of it. Anyway. What follows is not based on a statistical methodology of any sort, but, like, having spent over seven years amongst now anarchists uh, and other involved in and others involved in direct action, and I think I'm in the position to make some initial generalizations. Uh, the first is that, like, activists from the truly wealthy backgrounds are extremely, are exceedingly rare. In the terms of economic backgrounds, in fact, uh, anarchists tend to be extremely diverse. Natal global elites, anti-Sidemic Russell. yep, yep, yep. If anything, that does set them off from the bulk of Americans, it is that they are, are disproportionately likely to have attended college. Oh, actually, I haven't. Um, many, of course, are themselves students, but the activist core seems to be made of what might be even called post-students. Young women and men who have completed college, but are still living some, something like students, at least insofar as they, they are not mostly in regular career-oriented 9-to-5 jobs or child-rearing households. I should emphasize, while this is the core, it's certainly not the overwhelming majority. In New York, for instance, there is now a anarchist mom's group, mother's group, nice. Uh, the average meeting of NYC Dan would normally include high school students and retirees as well, along with, say, 40-year-old uh, uh, squatters, many of whom had never attended an institution of higher learning. And NYC Dan was considered by many other activists uh, decidedly upscale. The closer to the squatter scene one gets, the more one encounters activists uh, without a formal, formal uh, schooling. And this becomes already universal of uh, the case when one gets to the level of the travelers mostly teens and, and men and women in their 20s runaways or living lives of voluntary homelessness moving from city to city i think um just want to like uh, mention something about the, the squatters scene in actually no uh, 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 I forgot that thought. Uh, that's fine. Let's just move on. Uh, just as in the heyday of the IWW in the early decades of the 20th century, there was a rich culture of hobos and hoppers of freight trains. So there's uh, is still a uh, uh, so there is still today. Now I'm reminded of the scene from Old Butter Royal at the very beginning, um, where the three escape uh, men went on the train, and uh, George Clooney character says. By any chance, any of you guys be smithies? Or, if not smithies, uh, have like a, a, a trade in education and skills in the metallurgical works, and then just get drags off the train. He sure just like, just like, he, he went back and, and just like helped the other guys on, but then again, it, it wouldn't have been a funny scene to start the movie. Uh, it's. And then, as now, uh, most do consider themselves anarchists. Many are orphans, escapees, or runaways of very, of a, uh, of very modest uh, backgrounds, with little access to educational institutions, though are Advent readers, and many verse in radical theory, in my own experience, most often some variation of French situationalism. Hmm. 
I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Something I, I wanted to talk about. I think I'm, I have like a part of a medium article up right now, but I wanted to like talk about my own experience of like, I happened to just not go to college. It was more of a personal choice of me. I just like don't want the debt. I accrued debt already on my own anyway. Um, but it's, it's, it, but thankfully, no one has ever like uh, criticized me for like, oh, you never went to college? Well, screw you then, or anything like that, or think less of me because I never have. In fact, actually, it, it, a bit the opposite happened. Like, someone was surprised to learn I never went to college because of like how well informed I am. That, that's just because I, I I just read as much as I can and when I can, or in or consume other like uh, information as it is. Which makes me think of, like, some way of, like, like putting up syllabuses or putting up the courses or putting up the classes, as it were, up online and and have that to be an option. And not, not like, actually sign up for online classes, as it were, because at least there you do get the access to a teacher, to instructors, to someone that, like, can help you understand things. I think that is very important to the education process for those who, like, need that. But I wonder, it's like, what what is kid we can more... um open source uh the college experience of the world and some aspects of the college experience maybe you can never be open source or you have to like uh seek out the, like a reading group or a writing group or if that's kind of like a group on your own to do the readings as it were or just like sign yourself and things to do and actually the dsa can like facilitate that in some areas there's a lot of like groups where it's just like hey here's the reading before this uh, meeting as it were and it's not required but it's encouraged and because they're going to mention the articles that is there and that's in something that's like I wonder if we can, um, like I said, open source as work. But that's a topic I'll like explore uh, later because, yeah, because uh, yeah, even uh, I'm sure that the institutions of like higher education does like benefit a lot of people. And I'm not saying that like oh, let's get rid of the colleges. No, no, that benefits a lot of people. Uh, my only problem was that, that like the cost of it was like too much for me, and I didn't consider uh, getting into debt to be like worth it. And also, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it either. And I have, like ideas of what I want to do as a career, and as like change over time. But uh, anyway. Um, while the Travelers may be numerically a relatively minor element in the movement and somewhat marginal, most hate, most hate meetings, there are likely to be significantly more of them at any major mobilization than any other who actually has a trust fund. There are also important, uh, symbolically, because they're, uh, they set a kind of romantic uh, standards for automated experiences, dumpster diving, food, refusing pay, and paid employment. That represents one possible idea for those wishing to establish an existence outside the logic of capitalism. I can see why they actually are big into the French and the situationalists as well. I, I did read a Gear de Boer's um, Society of Spectacle. It was quite an interesting read. But then it's kind of like the, the criticism, uh, the, that's the thesis of the book, it's just like, it's just all around you. If you're plugged into the system, you're just like, get um, absorbed into the system. And so trying, so I can see how the French situation, or so students of the French situation were trying to like create an existence outside the logic of capitalism. I'll continue. There are also those who join uh, such a wor world voluntarily. Uh, they normally are college ex educated or sometimes college dropouts of a far more exalted uh, social class. This is a sort of universal collaborative celebrated in the popular anarchist books like uh, Crime Inc.'s uh, novel Evasion 2001. Ooh, a, a, a fantasy of... A semi-fantasy of a middle-class white punk kids who drop out to join this world, living off trash and leftovers of the industrialized uh, society. Nope, number 34. Uh, considering here that the falling pan peons uh, to... Okay, I'm going to look at that word. Duck, duck, go. Let's try that first. Where is that word that I was looking up? Duh, duh, duh. Okay, open up and what's your dictionary? Pian. Pian. Okay. 
Well, I now know how to pronounce it. I have to just remember how to pronounce it. Uh, considering the following opinions of dumpster diving, preaching, um, what does peeing actually mean? I, uh, a joyous song or hymn of praise, tribute, thanksgiving, or triumph. Ooh. Preaching salvation through trash. I was uh, up against a lifetime of upper class conditioning. You die from eating that food, they say. The living dead of the working the workforce. Giving health advice by what logic is the food deadly the moment it is entered the trash bag or passed through the back door. Food that has been on the shelf uh, moments prior. It was, it was a naive faith in the. Pure ten of these store bought food. Okay, I got a sneeze. I think I have a um, mic with the mute button. It was in the not, it was a naive faith in the pure in the purity of store bought food and a staunch sureness of trash as poison. Almost funny. Well, I couldn't be sure where they learned their garbage superstition, but they paid for it each day from nine to five. It was sad, deeply rooted conditioning, conditioning of the benefit to the corporations only, at the expense of millions of broken backs and wasted lives for those who work to eat. Crime Dean, uh, 2001, uh, page number 26, of that novel that uh, they were referred to, Evasion. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and considering that, like, and I've heard in places that, like, dumpster diving is actually a crime, it's just, uh, the, the capitalist, uh, entitlement that, like, yes, this is food that we are throwing away, no one's going to eat it, but you still cannot dive in the dumpster and grab it. As it were, but that's how like the organizations of food not bombs kind of like started. Yes, ideally we wouldn't like be producing food just to throw it away, but right now that's what we do with food because it's commodity instead of like a human right. It, we produce 1.5 at times as many uh, as much food as we actually need to feed the whole world, and 40 percent of it never gets eaten, gets thrown away, all because um, it's commodity need to be bought and sold, and. That's how we like get so many people that are starving, and hungry, like outside of like Safeway, begging for food or begging for money to buy food, while the Safeway just that night throws the food away and doesn't give it to charities, and they can't give it to charities or it's not profitable to do so because they don't get much of a tax incentive or a tax break to do so. Capitalism, there we go. There, in the nutshell, you need the, the businesses, firms like Safeway need an incentive to actually do something like do good for others. In this current system, as it is. Yes, but I would I love ideally that we don't have this system as it is. But since this is the current system as it is, Food Not Bombs actually does dumpster knives and like feed homeless people and feed uh, people in need. Anyway, uh, such a life can uh, represent a kind of vision of more purity. A total rejection of an industrialized society seen as an engine for the production of enormous qualities of quantities of waste, insofar as it assumes to be no longer possible to simply leave the system to establish an autonomous existence in the woods. And note number 35, click there. And though a few anarchists are in, in interested in those who carry out real experience in that this direction, yep, I definitely heard of like those kind of uh, people that like do that, and people who definitely have like tried to like live that lifestyle for like a month or so, like taking a break as were. Um, the best one and can do is to live off its like font sun and, and jet sun. Okay, looking those words up again. I'm gonna like just go with like a Webster. Mm. Flotsam. Flotsam. Okay, that's worth uh, the uh, floating wreckage of uh, ship or cargo, and jetsam would probably be the same for like uh, aerospace. Jetsam. Yeah, it's a flotsam and jetsam. Okay.
Many dumpster divers are quite proud of the fact that, despite the fact that they live off trash, they manage to maintain a rigorous uh, vegetarian diet. Many young anarchists, uh, the most hardcore sorts, follow suits to various degrees. In New York, there is a young man named um, Tradius, uh, uh, Tradius, uh, who claims he managed to get on by roughly $5 a month, occupying empty buildings until the police expel him, dumpster diving food, and all while producing, with some friends, a monthly guide to free events in New York. Uh, Tradidus is a regular of the direct action scene. He's something of an extreme case, and considered his and considered a rather a heroic figure as a result. But many see this is really living the life in a way that most do not. To be honest, a lot cannot. It's it, unfortunately, it's kind of like a, if you're, and this is actually the argument that like um some capitalist bootlickers, I would say, they would argue uh, to us the like socialist communists and anarchists is like okay then it, but hey you can just go off and live in the woods if you hate capitalism so much like that argument's like why do you have a computer why do you have a smartphone as it were or and it's like listen so not everyone can do that it, it, it's if you're able-bodied then yes you can do that and some people actually do practice that but that's not a life for everyone and not everyone wants that life honestly i love the technology that we have Mm. Yes. Um, it, which is why, uh, like I mentioned in the previous chapter, I don't agree with narco primitivists. No, and David Graeber mentioned them in a little bit. Um, now, if they are they're if they're fantastic activists and they do a lot of work in the local community for their community, uh, I'm not going to like shut them away for the work that they're doing. I just don't agree with their ideology of like. Let's all revert their society back to let's all revert uh, human society back to hunter gatherer scavenger uh, era, uh, things and stay like that. No, I don't agree that like civilization itself is a problem. I, it, it's more as the systems we currently have, not like civilization itself. But anyway, while few. Uh, while few resort to say uh, street hustling or thief a uh, theft, uh, for those who do uh, who do, there is a strong eth ethic of shoplifting that insists that it is only legitimate to steal from large corporation outlets and never mom pop stores. I do agree. Oh wait, no, no, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to click on the the note number thirty six. Uh, I know a number of young men uh, having to admit, even boast of, uh, having been uh, street hustlers at one time or another, but fewer women, and though a certain validation of the role of sex worker has become more common since the middle of the decade. Sex work is work. No, no, I didn't want to like, click the, back to the previous page, no, I want to click on 36 to get back to the book. Um, if they can avoid it. Uh, practice like dumpster diving are considered entirely ordinary in anarchist circles. In the kitchen of the New York offices of the Independent Media Center, there was a post for many years, the scheduling indicating at times local restaurants were legally obliged to throw away their sushi. Activists on bicycles would regularly make the rounds to pick up the piles of sushi rolls, all still neatly shrink-wrapped in plastic trays and containers, and deposit them in in the IMC, IMC uh, refrigerator. At another stop, one could regularly find perfectly edible bread bowls and bagels. As Food Not Bombs activists often point out, before major mobilization, there was absolutely no problem scrounging up free fruit for, say, uh, tens of thousands of people in a city like New York. If no one wants to put it in the effort, though, coming up with like utensils can often be more difficult. There is, I should also note, a counter uh, discourse here. The majority of activists who are trying to come to some kind of compromise with the mainstream economy can just as easily dismiss the travelers and squatters and dumpster divers as crusters, couriers, and gutter, and gutter punks. And coasting on their white privilege, or as middle class kids, playing in poverty in a way. Uh, that's that's a good point. Insulting the real hardship of the homeless or the dispossessed. Uh, note number 37. Nope. Oh. Oh, what? Why can't I, I not I click on the note? Okay. I don't know why that's not working. Let's click on number 36. 
that seems to work. Then we go to note number 37. Some of them uh, are certainly including all of the characters in Crime Meets the Novel. Often those who will make such accusations are unaware of the uh, existence of genuine homelessness or dispossessed anarchists. Hmm. Yeah, fair. Yeah, it works. Go back there, but I can't click here to go back to notes. Anyway. But often, but often the critique is mixed with some sort of ambivalence of respect, too. Most uh, activists, and again, I'm using the term activists here, mainly as a shorthand for anarchists or others involving anarchist-inspired uh, direct action policies, I do feel they have to make some compromise with the existing economic order. Most feel that, like one of those, so is very much a personal call. It's rather rare, in my experience, to hear the same sort of accusation of selling out of compromise as treason. There are so common in the 1960s and 1970s. Obviously, if one becomes a publicly agent of for Monsanto or a stockbroker, it would certainly be felt uh, to compromise one activist credentials, but it would have to be is something almost almost that extreme. Note number 38. Um, during the time that I was a professor at Yale, I was surprisingly rarely challenged at this account. When I was, it was inevitably a email, but people I didn't know who was not actually working with. Obviously at Yale, it was a slightly different story. And yeah, um, it, and that's the thing though, because uh, it's only from like non leftists, only from like other liberals or conservatives, even where they just like they say, Oh, you hate the modern society, you have to participate on. Like, why do you have the iPhone? Why do you have the smartphone, or anything like that? It kind of ignores that, like, for the most part, a lot of people actually do need to. Um, participate in society in order to like live. Um, like this was a terrible comic that I saw. Well, it was criticized in the position that like, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes homeless people would have smartphones or have other like things or have a car. They will need the smartphone to actually get jobs. They will need a car to actually like travel and move around. And and so it's not a good idea for them to sell their smartphone to get for food or sell the car to get for food because. The uh, argument is that, like, hey, why are you in food stamps? You have a smartphone, you're able to afford that. Why do you have a car? Why do you need food stamps? You have a car, you're easily able to afford that. And and so there's only if someone has no smartphone, has no car, and no home, as it were, then they're truly homeless, and then they're truly are, are, are qualified for food stamps, as it were. But even then, to, like, some people, no, you're not qualified for that. you got to, like, to attempt, try to, like, get a job. It's easier for them to get a job if they had a car or have a smartphone. Just, ah, uh, terrible. So I actually, I'm actually no problem if like uh, starting as soon as possible, and there would be a government program or some kind of program to give homeless people smartphones for them to be able to communicate with others or them to be able to like contact other things and possibly be able to like get a job. And I'm not gonna like shame anyone for like having a smartphone yet they're homeless or having or a smartphone yet being poverty. I mean, I'm I I have. A, a tablet and the computer, yet I'm an anarchist. Mm -hmm. It's not a contradiction to like have all this technology and be an anarchist. Anyway, um, they said, so, yeah, we all participate in society and capitalism in order to survive, but we still criticize this system that we're in. Still see some liberals just like um, dog uh, shit on us for that, uh, though. Um, obviously, here too, there are exceptions. The most hardcore one's own choices, and the more likely one can write off those who live a more comfortable or compromised lifestyle of life. <clears throat> Older activists, over 30, or especially over 40, who are most likely to have a full-time job, often work in industries centering around the dissemination of knowledge and ideas. In the, in the New York scene, I... I know a handful of writers and journalists as a large number of teachers, especially grade school and through uh, high school uh, librarians, even one high school graduate, high school guidance counselor, and many tied in one way or another to the printing industry, a very traditionally radical op occupation. I mean, 
we still need the you know, teachers, writers, and journalists, and the like, high school counselors as well. And the print industry is very important. Some are theater managers, playwrights, choreographers, or are otherwise adjacent to the arts. Recently, the arts. A surprising small number, in my experience, uh, work full time for NGOs, uh, non government organizations. At least this is true in the specific, especially direct action ends of things. Uh, younger and Activists, uh, the majority, uh, live in the kind of extended quasi adolescence that I call post students. Tend towards the sort of part time jobs that allow very flexible times and hours. This is partly because the changing nature of the job market in the U.S. has made full time work harder to come by. This was written in 2006 and has gotten harder and harder, and now there's the gig economy, which is making it harder. And just with the gig, and now we're projected to, for fifty percent of the work to be done freelance. So fifty percent of the work is not being done by employees, as it were they are independent contractors. And so those independent contractors have to work out their own retirement plan, their own benefits, and their own health care, and all those sort of things. Um, my uh, friend John Brockman, who co- who hosts uh, Social Justice Alchemy, uh, he's an adjunct professor. He's not going to get tenure. It's he just it's um, I'm not going to say it's like part time or like minimum wage. Like uh, doing community college uh, professoring or uh, teaching, but it's kind of close to that level, I think. And so, yeah, I think he only makes like twenty five thousand a year, if I remember correctly. And is that true? Simply for living in Seattle or live, you know, working in Seattle, because Seattle has a minimum wage of sixteen dollars, I make more than that. Um, it means that like I make more than my you know, friend John Brockman, who's a community college uh, chemistry teacher. Uh, that just shows you how uh, little we like pay our teachers as well. Um, uh, and yeah, it's like the changing market is making full time jobs hard to come by. That's continuing, unfortunately. Um, many end up tempting, but also because flexibility is so important to them, some pick up a specific uh, tr- uh, translatable skill. They learn bartending or web design, become um, lightning or sound technicians, acquire skills in catering. All skill, all are skills that make it fairly easy to pick up work from a week or a month and then move on. Working as a musician is also gives flexibility, but it pays so little one rarely can support oneself without working full time. Some work in activist friendly enterprises, most often vegan kitchens or health food stores. Others, others become civil engineers. Quote note number thirty nine. Um, this is an interesting tendency for anarchists to be drawn to urban planning. Mm. Uh, there are. There are also a handful of like full-time organizers who work for activist groups like Rainforest Action Network, Ruckus uh, Society, various uh, peace groups, or, un- or labor unions, or needle exchange programs. Though those g- these jobs pay notoriously little, and activists of, of much of more modest means often can't afford to take them. Many such jobs pay nothing at all, but activists will still do uh, uh, them on a part-time basis. In what follows, I will try to outline an ideal, uh, typical activist life course, generally from people I know in Dan, uh, CLAC, uh, the ACC, uh, the IMC, and similar groups in the Northeast around 2000 to 2003. That's the time I was in high school. Doing so is necessary, a hypothetical ex- exercise, since it assumes a history will remain constant, which is unlikely. But projecting current patterns, one might come up with like something like this. Our ideal uh, typical direct actionist is likely to either become politicized in high school. Oh, that happened to a lot of us uh, in my generation because of 2001. Uh, especially through the punk scene or in college, becoming active in campus organizations. After in either graduating or dropping out of college, they are likely to spend anywhere between one or in ten years of intense involvement in activist groups. During the first few years, they will attend meetings regularly, perhaps three, four, or five a week, in the days right before action, sometimes four or five a day, usually in a variety of different groups while supporting themselves through casual or part-time labor. 
This first phase is very intense and often almost impossible to sustain continuously. Most break it up in one or another. For example, one might spend six months doing activist work in one's hometown, then spend a few months intensely working for money, then once then once one has saved enough for a plane ticket, take off to some distant locale to help uh, set up IMCs in South America, do solitary work on the West Bank or Chiaspis, absorb the squatter scene in Europe, or participate in a tree set. Many at this stage are on the road around half the time, or one might uh, keep oneself sane for occasionally Plug, uh, punching, plunging into a completely different sort of project, an artistic one, for example, an intense romance, only to reappear a, month, a few months later. One might run off for a few months to work on an organic farm, uh, a habit so common that there's actually an acronym for it, to wolf, wolf uh, work on organic uh, farm. I know that when Tammy says wolf that she doesn't mean work on organic farm. But I'll tease her uh, that, like, it, it, that's not what she means. I'm informed that technically this is the acronym is actually WWF of for Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms and derives from a formal network in Canada. But it can also be used as a verb more informally. WWF. But WWF. Work, uh, work on an organic farm. Uh, those who... Uh, all, the, those who con- concentrate on those who concentrate all their energies on one place often tend to burn out quickly about a year or two and quit in expectations or else find some specific international or community related project to concentrate their energies on and withdraw from everywhere else as a result groups like D- NYC Dan soon come to make up a active uh, core of of and a kind of uh, uh, I used to know how that word is pronounced. Hold on. Again, look up another word. This is what I do. Penumbra. Penumbra, a space of particular illuminations, such as a clutch, between the perfect shadow of all sides and full eyes. Ooh. Um, as a result, groups like NYC Dan soon come to make up an active core and a kind of penumbra of semi-related activists who were never really seen at meetings anymore, but did often show up at actions or parties, and whose knowledge contacts and experiences were available for those who still had personal contact with them. Younger act- anarchists who don't live in squats, uh, again, the majority often the majority don't, often live in collective houses or apartments, frequently in poor or artisanal gentrified neighborhoods. Uh, some live in activist spaces. There was is several people living in NYC, I am New York, IMC, um, during the years 2000 to 2003, and others in Walker Space, a kind of IMC agent that uh, house a performance space and television studios. This this prosperous and uh, prosperous prosperous. Oh my God! I remember it again. Tavi, you don't have to sell it to me. I remember. Prosperous. Ah! Anyway, brains. Words are pain. Um, enough to be able to afford a, a, a reasonable uh, size uh, apartment often allowed at least some space in uh, some <laughs> in the apartment to be used for larger collective purposes. Eventually, almost everyone ends up in the kind of semi-reti- in semi-retirement. Those who become professional, paid activists, uh, usually end up in a different uh, social menu. Some go to grad school. Grad students typically remain involved for a few years then, as they become overwhelmed with work and experiences the pressures of professionalization, drop out of activism entirely. There are exceptions, of course, but surprisingly few. <sighs> Others have children, or settle down, frequently with non-activists, or finally take a full-time um, career employment. 
There are certainly those who maintain ongoing presence nonetheless, but this is typically enough because they found some career that keeps them in, in close to the activist universe. Becoming a labor lawyer and still do legal work for anarchists as well, for example, or manage a radical bookstore, or become or because they continue to live in a collective house or a squad or a national community, or else because they learn how to carefully limit their involvement to a single manageable project, the later is difficult. Since demands on an activist times are potentially infinite, the trick is to staying involved over a long time is to find a way to resist the temptation to overcommit. That's something that like that's not, that's something that my dad has to like learn and other people in professional circumstances for non activist work but in other kind of like projects as it were the you you have the right to say no i have to remember that myself uh, phoenix in a short video on her youtube channel has like talked about this too you have the right to say no or just like say sorry i can't make it to this event because it's important to do self-care and to avoid burnout Relatively few, in my experience, successfully managed to do this. Mm. Easier said than done, I guess. One later thirties, once later thirties, or certainly forties and fifties, then are typically a period of complete or near um, or near complete withdrawal. But if historical patterns hold, there is for a certain number a period even later in life of re-engagement. After one's children are in college, one breaks up with a longtime partner or retires, one might find one might very well find oneself drawn back into the world of activism again, occasionally at least for a little while, on an intense basis at, uh, as at the beginning. And now, now to part two, uh, class backgrounds and trajectories. I mentioned that the only sense. Uh, no, actually, before I continue on, I, it's, it's been a, a about an hour since the last break, so it's a good time to practice another self-care or break. Um, I might not make another cup of tea, uh, but I will take the opportunity to like use the bathroom, so I'm going to go transition over to the Be Right Back screen. I'm going to make sure to transition over to the Be Right Back screen, and everyone... Take your meds if you haven't. Uh, get eat some food if you haven't. Uh, Tavi should go to make food if she hasn't. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and, and you do that, Tavi. Uh, and then um, get up and stretch. That's an important thing. Do posture checks and like uh, use of facilities if you can. And uh, I'm going to transition over to the be right back screen, and I will be right back. <laughs> 